Good evening, Danvers. Um, I am uh, Mark Zuberek, and I have today uh, John Toomey. John has been a fixture on the shows for many, many years, but welcome to the Topics of the Town News, October 7th, 2021. Welcome to our local news broadcast report by Danvers News Commentators, meant for Danvers residents. We sometimes have to expand our coverage because we are not totally independent town either in Massachusetts or the United States. Our focus will always be on local issues. Our show today will consist of several segments. We'll start with the update of the Selectman's meeting. Segment one will be resident concerns regarding the Beverly Airport expansion, outpouring of noise complaints, and this will be a condensed version because we've done this for many weeks now. Segment two will be resident concerns regarding the Danvers School Department and specifically the current school committee. Segment three, if we get to it, Resident concerns regarding the Department of Public Utilities and specifically citizens' petition on the spending by the Municipal Light Board. They're spending our uh, customer uh, uh, rates. The agenda and opinions are solely by the topics of the town news host and commentators. So today, John, what I wanted to introduce is a function that I went to last Sunday, the 26th of September. David, if we can show a couple of clips of that, it was the Freedom Rally on the steps of the Massachusetts State House, and it was held on Sunday, September 26th. The details of this uh, demonstration and uh, rally uh, will be reported on a film that I took on the uh, uh, rally on September 26th, and it'll be imminently uh, released. That's quite a crowd. That, that's what I wanted to make sure that people understand. Go to the next clip, David. Uh, again, this was, and, and I, my estimation was roughly five, maybe 7,000 people. And even at the uh, comments that I've heard, uh, that was very significant. Next clip, David. Here I am interviewing individuals uh, at the conclusion of the uh, rally, but there were four or five individuals that I interviewed and one of the primary one was uh, uh, Jeff Deal, who's a candidate or is announcing his candidacy for governor in the state of Massachusetts. Republican? He is, he is Republican, that's what I was told, but he is going to primary uh, Governor Baker. And Governor Baker has not decided whether he wants to keep the job or not. <laughs> well, he, I think he's been on the hot seat for many, many uh, months and years right, uh, lately. That's so, quite a crowd, though. So <laughs> that is the uh, location is right in front of the State House at the steps. And uh, this overflow was all the way down into the uh, Boston Commons and people were able to uh, communicate and uh, uh, demonstrate at the rally. The primary objective was against the imposition of these restrictions that the governor and the health directors in our towns have imposed on our residents. And now what they're doing is they're firing uh, 
nurses, doctors, and uh, uh, physical uh, therapists uh, that will not take the uh, vaccine. And they're basically putting them out of business. Well, isn't that a health problem? Well, it supposedly is a health problem, but is it a health problem now? The uh, resolution well, of the health issues has happened over the last 18 months. This was declared to be a health issue in uh, March of 2020. But it's coming back. Uh, how do you know that? We do not have legitimate information coming back from our health organizations. Well, that's one of the problems, there's not enough information. There, there is no information because they want to hide it because, and, and I'll declare this my own opinion, and I'm going back to the old country and uh, the communism at that time, this is to restrain and control our population. And I stick to it. So, the uh, purpose of the rally was to identify to our government in the state of Massachusetts that people object to what is going on. And watch the uh, presentation that's going to be released very, very soon. So uh, I look forward to seeing that. Uh, that the issue now is that the restrictions are being re-implemented because we've had some relief on some of these restrictions, but now the governor has basically delegated those restrictions to the local communities and the health departments. Now, the health board in the town of Danvers will be holding a meeting tonight at 6 p.m. at the senior center. I, I wish a lot of people would go and ask them the question, what drove you to support the town manager's restrictions that he's imposed on the masks in the municipal buildings? And we don't really know whether the vaccines are being imposed on our employees. What has he pushed on the masks? He has implemented the mask policy for all municipal-owned buildings and the employees that are in there. So if you want to go into the town hall, you have to wear the rag. And the library. And the library and the schools. And we'll go into a school department uh, discussion later on. Uh, the, the school committee has basically capitulated to the Board of uh, Education from the state of Massachusetts. So they're using the Board of Education as an excuse to implement the mask policies in the schools. And they're going down to five years old. So uh, that's a discussion that we'll have okay. a little later on. Uh, on the select, select board topics, um, I am looking at a discussion that was held, uh, no in-person public meeting for the revisions of the zoning that are scheduled for town meeting in November. So no details given. Dan Bennett found several inconsistencies at the board meeting. So the planning board and the planning department are hiding behind the mask because they do not hold public meetings in regards to all the changes that they want to impose. That doesn't make sense. Well, that's exactly the point here. And I think Dan Bennett, even at the selectmen's meeting, made that same point, but he wasn't as direct as we're, we are right now. <laughs> uh, the planning department and the planning board are still holding remote meetings on television. So they will not go in front of the public and listen to what their comments are. So that's one of the concerns I found at the selectmen's meeting. Uh, there were two infractions on uh, liquor licenses uh, that were debated with conclusions to give three-day penalties suspended for one year.
which is, I, I believe, it's fair. But the, the one thing that got me at that meeting is the police chief was asked repeatedly for his opinion on what the punishment should be. That's not what the police chief is there for. The police chief is to enforce whatever the liquor uh, licensing board, which is the selectmen, have identified. <coughs> All he does is enforce the law, and he found two infractions that were presented to the board of selectmen. And I hope the board of selectmen stops asking the chief for what the punishment should be. They're hiding behind the No, of course they are. They don't want to make a decision because they're politically uh, viable. Where the police chief is doing his job. And he did a good job. Uh, he's not the enforcer. He's the enforcer of the law, not giving the punishment out. He's not the judge. But they make the law. They do. They have, they have their own little book of uh, things that happen. The other thing that I noticed is that there was a little bit of discussion that I like to carry over is the American Rescue Plan disbursements. Uh, we presented that last uh, show. Uh, what will the schools get? And how much will the funds be used and where? The, the town has decided to use the $8 million that they have accumulated through the American Rescue Plan by the federal government. And they're going to use them on projects. And, and I think you have a copy of that over there, John. Yes. And that's available from the town hall. Uh, there are probably uh, 20 items that they have separated the money to. And one of the things uh, is that is a lot of road work that they're uh, doing. Uh, they're doing some uh, water treatment uh, work. So it's, it's money being spent in does, the right does, direction. Does this reduce our overall budget? Oh, no, you're thinking into my head, John. <laughs> does this reduce our overall $115 million budget that we passed at town meeting? This money should go back to town meeting and be divided according to what the town meeting uh, dictates. But the decisions are being made by the selectmen. No, the decisions are being made by the town manager. They're not even consulted to the selectmen, I, as far as I see. Now, if you look at Beverly, if you look at Salem, they are asking the population, the counselors, and different organizations of where that money should be allocated. Not in this town. The town manager made the decision. He's going to, you know, disperse it. And... and it's, it's rightfully where it belongs because it's being used for physical projects that have to be done. But the thing is, ask the population, ask the town meeting, ask the legislative body of this town, not just be a dictator like I've been saying for the last two years. So, but the other shoe that's going to fall is how much money is the school department going to get? And how is that money going to be dispersed? So that is a question that's going to come up, and we're, we're going to have to start looking at that. Um, there was a very garbled discussion of the Stantec Consultants report on Rapid Recovery Planning Program, which is a department of... Um, HUD, basically, uh, Housing Department. And this was a uh, report that was prepared by some consultant that basically I couldn't understand what was being said when I watched the program. Uh, the one thing that I like to mention, and I think I mentioned it last time, John, is the board meetings are now held sometimes at 5, sometimes at 6, 
sometimes at 7, instead of the regular time that we used to have meetings at 7 p.m. Has our select board aged to a point where they go to bed at 9 p.m.? <laughs> I mean, uh, that board is aged quite a bit, but uh, 9 p.m. is awful early to go to bed. Well, I think one of the problems that varying the times that the meetings are held really makes it difficult for the public. You can't make any plans for the future not knowing what the devil time it's going to be and for I the would, meeting. I was sitting and watching the uh, select, select board meeting. There were empty chairs right there in front. There was only one individual that I recognized and it was Bill Bradstreet was commenting on some of the items. And one of the items is, uh, let's just talk about the Pop-Up pop Park. <laughs> this is the invasion of the Santander CBS parking area. Yeah. And everybody was patting themselves on the back that it was such a success. Yeah, maybe some kids sat there in the afternoon after they got through school. There really is no use to that particular section. Uh, very seldom are there anybody in there. There's never any big crowds. It just looks empty. And it looks shaggy. Uh, shabby, maybe. <laughs> because it looks like a... Uh, uh, outcome in a uh, neighborhood that doesn't have uh, the right uh, streets repairs and things like that. Well, certainly uh, removing all those parking spaces, I think, uh, uh, made it a little bit tougher for the average person to get out of town and park. Well, it's been, it's been reported many times that this pop-up park should have been down by... Uh, across from uh, Lyons Funeral Home in that parking lot, if, if that, and that was accessible all around for parking and all that on the street, or the parking lot next to the town hall, right, right on the side here in front of uh, DCAT. So th there are suggestions, nobody's listening, they're just spending the money that they got in the grant and they want to spend every Yeah, penny but the on. other side of that statement you just made is nobody is participating. The voters aren't turning out. The, the citizens of Danvers aren't going to the meetings. They aren't checking on what in the world the uh, town government is doing, unfortunately. That's right. So... The other items on the select board uh, discussion uh, was this Indigenous People Day. Bill Bradstreet was very uh, instrumental in asking the question two weeks ago, what has the town decided of what the definition or the name of uh, October 11th will be? And what they came up with is last year, I think it kept Columbus Day as, as a definition, but this year, what they've come up with, and I see a letter to the Board of Selectmen from the uh, uh, Human Rights and Inclusion Committee, uh, that it should be named People's in Indigenous, Indigenous People's Day. And what they're uh, asking the select asked the select board to draft a letter to the state legislators uh, to rename the, the uh, holiday to Indigenous Peoples Day. And I looked up the uh, legislation that was uh, presented. Uh, it's a very short bill, uh, basically changed the name. But I also noticed that the petition that was written and signed by everybody, oh, there's 20 individuals on here, but none of them are from the Essex County. 
<laughs> so we're we're being uh, led by uh, Middlesex, Suffolk, uh, Hampshire County, Franklin County, Bristol and Middlesex County, Middlesex again, Hampshire, Franklin and Worcester, Middlesex and Middlesex. Are we responding to the wishes of these legislators? That well, it's obvious funded? that there's, nobody's responding. Nobody even well, cares, unfortunately. When you, when you look at this letter and the recommendation, uh, this letter does not say anything. And, and this legislation was filed back in 2019. So it's been sitting in committee all this time. Well, the request really doesn't make much sense. That's the well, point. That, that's, a, that's an opinion, and we stick to it. <laughs> all right, next item. Uh, there was one good thing that happened at the uh, meeting, and Comcast came through with a 4% return to DCAT as an investment from the revenues that they collect because uh, that is a, that we have two companies that are supporting DCAT, Verizon and Comcast. Uh, they have the authority to run their programs through our wires and, yes. and all that. Uh, this time, Comcast came through with 4% as the payment that's going to be from their revenues of, our, of their customers. And it all depends on how many customers they have and they don't have. So now, according to the contract from Verizon, Verizon has agreed to increase their portion of the payment from 3%, which they negotiated, and they will revert now to a 4% payment. So, the payments are coming due in unison at 4% plus additional costs for materials and equipment. Well, that's good news. It is excellent news, and I am very happy to hear that. Uh, the one thing that I uh, noticed at the meeting is uh, the question was asked by the Board of Selectmen, how much is the town contributing to the operation of DCAT. They have been using DCAT as a cash cow for their programming and for the installations at different locations. All the equipment that has been installed at the senior center is paid for through these uh, revenue streams. The schools are uh, being paid for by these revenue streams. So the town, again, is using DCAT as a pilot program similar to the municipal light board that they have been milking for years. So that's a good thing, and I congratulate the <coughs> Danvers Cable Advisory Committee for coming through with such a nice return. Uh, the, the legal limit on those is 5%. So they have come closer because they've always been at 3%, both Verizon and Comcast. So good for them. Uh, they did an excellent job, and uh, I'm proud of them. The last item that I want to uh, you know, discuss is uh, the precinct boundaries. There is a map that has been developed through the number of residents that reside in each um, neighborhood and precinct, and then it's divided into precincts. And it's roughly eight precincts at 3,200, 300 um, residents. So that's how the town is divided. Now, the next thing that's going to come through is as a result of this precinct recalculation, the schools are gonna go through another set of boundaries to allocate the right population to each school. So that's a, that's a thing that's coming. But the most important thing that came out of it is that town meeting members, the current 
three-year, two-year, and one-year members in each precinct are going to be coming for re-election. Why? Why? Because now the boundaries have changed, the voters have changed, and they're going... In other words, you could be in a different precinct than what you normally have been. Right. It's very slight changes, but there are changes. How do you know that, that, uh, that you're changed? It doesn't matter. The uh, clerk has submitted or will be submitting this map to the state, uh, Secretary of State uh, office, because that has to be approved by them. But that's only to calculate the number of people in each precinct. But isn't that saying that some people be changed to a different precinct? They may be. Well, well doesn't that mean that you would be voting for different people? You yes. Yes. So there is a major change for some people. There, there, there. Is, there, there can be. And uh, this is a refreshing uh, development because now it's going to shake up the whole town meeting instead of the uh, one-third each time that they vote on them. And when does this take effect? Well, it'll be uh, the election in May. That so they have to vote on approval? No, not approval, but uh, for the election of the town meeting members, the election will be in May. First, first Tuesday first, in yeah. May. So, now, the one thing that I didn't touch and uh, I didn't want to... Uh, uh, we have a snippet for the Smith School, which was opened this last uh, week. And John, you want to talk about it? Yeah, you want to run that. Uh, there they are celebrating the uh, opening of the Smith Ribbon School. Cutting. You're right. It, uh, the old school has been, what, uh, 45 years, and they tore it down and they built a new one. And uh, from what I can, what little information there was available, there, there's a teaching has changed, and the idea between education has changed between what is uh, usable. Uh, the open classroom idea of 45 years ago was, has changed, uh, uh, moved away from open classroom uh, content. Uh, the new school cost $52 million. It uh, has a capacity of 465 students, uh, 82,000 square feet. It's a beautiful school. Uh, you want to do the other picture? David, can you flip? There's only one? Uh, okay. Okay. We'll take that. And... Uh, well, the thing uh, is that uh, it, it was a successful project, as far as I know. I have not attended the construction meetings or the uh, uh, coordination meetings. Other people took care of that. <coughs> it was done on time, and I believe within the uh, gross budget. Um, the number of students was calculated uh, at uh, three years ago to be at 465 students. That's the capacity. Uh, now what we're waiting for is basically the demolition of the old structure and resurfacing that area. And that's going to become parking. <laughs> parking for grammar school students. Well, I, 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 personally, I think the point is that over the past 40 odd years, uh, education has changed. Teaching has changed. Right. And at least my impression over the years is Danvers has always done fairly well in teaching their kids. Um, I, I, I don't know really how much trust you can put into the various reports that come out and the information. But it seems like Danvers always does fairly well. All right. Uh, we will be talking about that when we get to the school committee. Yeah. Uh, that's something that we need. 
so that concludes all of our uh, selectmen's items. Uh, the next segment I have is I just want to bring everybody up to date, and I don't want to belabor this, but uh, resident concerns regarding the Beverly Airport expansion, outpouring of noise complaints, and this is a condensed version of our report. Currently, no communications or monthly meetings held for the last five months. So what are they hiding? Assessed valuation of the 170 acres in Danvers are worth over $1 million in real estate taxes. Why are we leaving the revenue on the table? I believe that is the only thing that's going to move Beverly Airport to respond to the needs of the Danvers residents. You want to show the tape? Uh, we can show a tape. Uh, uh, David, can you show the uh, outline of the uh, runway extensions? <clears throat> the airport commission and the airport manager and the Beverly mayor are waiting for this issue to uh, waiting this issue out, basically. That's the reason I believe that's happening. They want the expansion and the FAA grant money. On this uh, uh, alternative two, which is basically the 300 foot extension of the runway uh, 1634 in both directions towards Danvers and towards Beverly. Uh, they cannot go any further in Beverly because they're in the wetlands and they can not go much further into Danvers. But if you look at the encroachment of the area, of the blast area from the plains, uh, it's going right into our neighborhoods. We have an impact and people have complained about it, but uh, the Beverly, Danvers, and Wenham residents were left out of the planning effort of this master plan. Well, see, I disagree with you on uh, the people haven't complained. They oh, they've complained, but they leave messages on the phone and they don't uh, get a response from the airport. Well, uh, certainly there hasn't been any news of anything going on at the airport, but uh, as far as I understand, it's done. They can uh, expand anything they want. They, they've already come through with the plans to, to expand it into uh, trans jet transportation, uh, covering uh, New York City and uh, the Cape and uh, Western Vineyard. Massachusetts. Right. So you're going to get it fairly well fairly soon and fairly noisy, that's for sure. Yeah, without, without the expansion of the runways on both ends by 300 feet, Beverly Airport has already been functioning as an overflow for Logan Airport, small plane airport landings. Encroachment into Danvers of these two football field lengths added to the runways, the length of the runway expansion and future expansions lead to larger and noisier planes. We already have the commuter jets. I've, I sat on my deck one evening at 11 o'clock or 11.30 at night, and here it comes. It's coming right over the area off of 95 in that, from the west side right over the house going towards Beverly. Other times it's primarily on Fridays leaving and Mondays returning. These planes are scheduled for departure and arrival at oddball times, nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, and they leave early, early in the morning. 
So uh, there's no response from the commission. Um, larger prop and jet leads to devastating noisy conditions for the entire community. The reach of the glide path and noise level starts at the Middleton Topsfield line and reaches Danvers and Beverly and noise abatement policies are not even considered. When will neighbors be able to enjoy their properties in peace? Well, it's, it's going to get worse, not better. Right. And the, uh, unfortunately, it's going to, the traffic is going to increase, which, which increases the noise level. And since if they wanted to do anything, they should have done it before now. Absolutely. Because now it's there and it's going to be done. It's just a matter of time. All right, John. Well, there's one thing, one question I do have is that uh, is this, this section of Danvers that is owned by the airport. Right. Why don't we tax them on it? Because we are so generous to the uh, communities adjoining uh, the airport because without a million dollars in the bank, they would uh, have to get funds from someplace else and they cannot operate. Wenham gets paid for their portion of real estate that is at the end of the runway on the Wenham well, side. Well, why don't we? Because we uh, have tried that in the past and the town manager and the board of selectmen do not want to impose that real estate fee. So, I believe that the residents in their wisdom should have a petition at to town mm. meeting to restore those funds back to the town of Danvers. A million dollars goes a long way and we are running out of funds in the town of Danvers. The real estate taxes are not going to carry everything. Well. All right. Uh, Beverly Airport has totally ignored noise complaints. People finally gave up. Need to have FAA and uh, Beverly Airport management reduce the intensive use and to become a good neighbor with all residents. Now, we already spoke about the uh, conditions in the neighborhoods that, uh, yes, the airport was there while there were fields uh, you know, surrounding it, but now it's all built out. People have to live there. The biggest problem that I see is when will Mayor Cahill finally get involved? Because he is running for re-election. Commissioners were very careful to exclude the mayor. The mayor is up for re-election on November 2nd. He needs to call, he needs a call at the Beverly City Hall. I have identified two sources of uh, people that can complain. One is the Federal Aviation Administration aviation noise ombudsman and I've given that address out the telephone number to the ombudsman is 781-238-7400 and I've also got communications with uh, Seth Moulton's office and Seth Moulton has uh, assigned Norm Abbott as the regional director to conduct this investigation or the communication between the FAA and the city of uh, Beverly because the FAA is under the auspices of the federal mm. congressman. Uh, Norm Abbott can be reached at 978-231-2867. One of the things that we need to do is we need to communicate with these individuals to make sure that this does not continue. So, I have communicated with both uh, organizations and I just hope that the other residents that are in 
impacted by the airport expansion uh, will demand that something be done. So, John, anything on the airport right now? The, the clip that we showed of the runway expansion is on the Danvers end and also on the Beverly end, but Beverly doesn't, it can't go any further. Well, uh, until <laughs> more people get involved and speak up, you're just kidding yourself. You're right. not going to get anywhere. This has already been achieved, and basically how bad it gets, it's just going to get worse until you step in and you do something. Do it now. Right. And, and the thing is that we have issues at the airport, as you may well know in the past. I've had issues. There are other operators at the airport that are well. having issues with the uh, airport manager, and that has to stop, and uh, the commission has to intervene. So Until they get involved, it's just wasting your time. All right. I have uh, segment number two, John, and that is more in relation to the resident concerns regarding the Danvers School Department and specifically the school committee itself. I have, I have written this and I've used it before, <coughs> but I like to repeat this one section. What has happened to the independent Danvers education system? We as residents pay most of the education costs per student. It's like sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars per student. And what are we getting in return? The school committee uh, has basically abdicated their position, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, this is primarily in regard to the restraints that are being imposed on our students, basically masks, vaccines, and the control of education because our students are not getting an education in this town. Recently, the governor has removed himself from imposing restrictive actions because the past actions taken were not legal and directly impacted our freedoms. The governor now wants to use local community boards to continue the state's illegal actions. He has now invoked the Board of Education to promote his illegal actions at the schools. When will Danvers School Committee declare our independence from these restrictions and the control of freedoms of our students and parents? Parents do not want any more physical constraints on their children. The school committee has abdicated their primary mission to educate our students. Education has taken a step backwards because we have become slaves to directed actions by, by our appointed officials. But does, does the Danville School have a reputation of teaching well? Well, that, we're going to get into that in a moment. Well, I'm just trying to introduce. Uh, now the school committee, who is really in charge of the level and completeness of our education system in our, for our 3,300 students. The, but they're hiding <coughs> behind the actions and directives from the Massachusetts Board of Education. I have, when, when I <coughs> ran for the school committee, I have read their uh, guidelines and their procedures and all of that. They do not make any independent uh, decisions. All they do is follow the state dictates. Why do we even have them there? The school department, the superintendent, and the board of education are running our schools. So our school committee is basically vacant because they really don't want to do anything. But let me, let me do this. Uh, we have gone into the education process, and if we can just go through 
the current MCAS uh, results. We have several results here, and this is grade 10 English, and you know, it went up in one and went down in the other, but it's primarily down. And the, the, what is down? The uh, percent of students performing to any specific level. Now, the students... What level? Well, there's exceeding expectation, meeting expectation, partially meeting expectation, and not meeting expectation. All right, this says so, achievement level. Right. Exceeding expectations, meeting okay. So what we have here is a list of all of the, these are available on the internet. Uh, the school committee or the school administration hasn't responded to any questions regarding this because they're trying to, and I hate to say this, cook the books to make them look better. But this whole uh, series of results are basically the results of the MCAS scores uh, for 20 20 and, yes, 2020 and 2021. Our students have basically been cheated out of one and a half years of education. Remote learning has failed. Parents had to rely on tutors and home schooling. Why did the school population decrease this year? How did we measure our performance? How did we spend the taxes on our children's education? Why were private schools able to operate as usual during the apparent pandemic? Education policies regarding curriculum content and expectations have, have focused on social issues, critical path theory issues, indoctrinations, health and sex education issues, social feelings, and not on true education subjects. Who authorized these policies and activities? What steps will we take to improve the current level of education and testing? That's been a question that's been raised over and over again, and the school committee, uh, I have received one uh, response. Uh, the children of the Davis schools getting a bad education. According to the statistics and the results of the MCAS, I believe so. Parents are frustrated to the point where they don't even go the to the school The numbers of parents who are complaining is small compared to the total number of parents. Absolutely. Because that doesn't the, make sense. Because the school department in their discussions or the school committee in their discussions basically only includes the parents of students in the schools. Now, that's 3,300 students, and maybe that's maybe 2,500 families. But what about the rest of the community? We have 26,000 residents in this town. They have nothing to say about it. Well, we're only talking about the school children. That's right. But the residents of this town deserve and represent the quality of education because every time you turn around, oh, our, uh, if, we, if we cut the budget on the schools, it's going to reflect on the value of our homes. Well, why aren't the larger numbers of parents getting involved? because they're too busy making a living and paying the high taxes and fees that we impose on our residents. And taxes, basically. But if they're getting lousy results, that doesn't make sense. Well, then this is a call for a uh, uprising, basically, of the parents of the students for now, because I, have, I will have a presentation next time, Parents Revolt Against Progressive Education Crisis that's going on. America's very future is a serious risk, not just from enemies abroad, but also from dedicated internal forces that seek to replace 
constitutional government with an authoritarian anti-Western culture regime. Parents sent their children to school to gain an education. Most hard-working, dedicated teachers want to provide that education. Unfortunately, a substantial portion of education bureaucrats and progressive faculty leaders have a whole different agenda. What should they do? The parents. They should go to the administration, demand that they improve the education and eliminate some of that feel-good uh, social programs that they have implemented. I mean, I, I went to some of those classes and it's... it's um, as a student or as an... No, as an observer yeah. at one time. I used to be able to walk through the high school from one end to the other without anybody even addressing me at the time when I was there. Now, I'll give you an example, and, and this has been repeated over and over again. Our graduates that come out of Danvers High School go to, and they're being pushed into college. They don't like them going to community college or uh, vocational schools after they graduate. Where do they go to? <coughs> They go to high, uh, like Syracuse, uh, Harvard, um, MIT. Uh, what they do, is, and I'll give you an example, specific example. They of, get there and when they can get in? They, when they get there, they get in. They get in because of various reasons. Now, when they go in for the first year, you're paying seventy thousand dollars a year let's say at Syracuse and the first year is a total repeat or encouragement to repeat whatever was supposed to be taught in the four years of high school so you're paying college level fees and tuition for a repetition of what they should have learned in high school but that the administration never wants to talk about that. That doesn't make sense. Well, it does, because it's true. And I have experienced myself, and I have experienced from other individuals that I have spoken to. This has been reported over and over again. So, uh, education and welfare of our students has always been a primary objective in Danvers. Today we have too many administrators, nurses, and psychologists who have falsely assumed the responsibility of bringing up our children. Where are the line teachers and parents in this formula? School departments are responsible for education and not for social development and social experimentation. Ma well, let me just follow up on that. This experimentation and socialization is nothing new. This has been going on for 20 years, 25 years. Because I know that when my girls were in school, that was happening then. But I didn't have the foresight to demand a change because uh, that was a uh, teacher's responsibility. And we trusted our teachers. But now the teachers have become slaves to the teachers union and to the administration because they depend on their job. So our school committee members need to refocus their activities to education and educating our students and not on controlling the social aspects of our school population. What are we afraid of? the China virus, or the retaliation by health department and teachers unions. Now, when I read this at the school committee meeting on August 23rd, oh boy, there was an uprising from the chairman of the school committee that I insulted China virus, using the term China virus, I insulted uh, billions of Chinese. 
<laughs> Come on, guys. The parents must take back their rights and resume the role of bringing up their children. School committees must rely on input by parents who entrust their children to your care. At the August 23rd meeting of the school committee, uh, they were uh, talking about masks, whether they should be imposed or not. But they delayed their decision because they expected the Board of Education to give them the cover because the Board of Education, through the governor, made sure that the kids wore masks. There's no need for it. There's no medical need. And we, as we have, we must restore the respect of our students and taxpaying residents. Well, I, I have to answer that one. Go for it. Well, uh, just the, you said there's no medical need. No. Most states where they have not enforced it, yeah. They have had an increase in the number of people who were... That's what's being reported. Well... You, we don't know the actual numbers or statistics. The statistics are all cooked. But the thing is... That's opinion. That, that's, hey, that's why we're here. That's why <laughs> we're here. Uh, they, need to, they need the freedom to choose not to wear masks. If the administration and the teachers are not vaccinated, then they should be. Can we move on and provide the best possible education to our students without all these restrictions and the social engineering that has evolved? So this was a statement that I um, sent out to the board of Sol uh, the bo uh, school committee board and I got a reply, but it was only through the chairman, and the chairman is an attorney, and there's another attorney on the board. Uh, they have an educator and a uh, business person, I guess. So the attorneys are running the show, and the attorneys are scared of their own shadows. So. I believe that we need a wake-up call to the school committee. So what we're going to do is we're running out of time, John. I will leave the, uh, the municipal light board results. You can see those results at the meeting that I filmed and is being shown on the government channel right now, municipal light board meeting in September and uh, take a look at that and you'll hear all of the reasons why they they didn't do the right thing and they got their hands slapped but we'll get to that uh, next show so what we have right now we have one minute left and what what I like to do is remind everyone that we have the Mark Twain uh, clip that I have been using over and over again. And John, the clip, it's, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they have been fooled. And that's an appropriate statement for our population right now. I have Any to agree with you. I think the town government is fooling more or less the residents of Danvers. The taxpayers. Thank you, John. And uh, stay tuned for our next uh, show, which will be on October 21st. And then we have schedules for November 4th and November 18th. And then we'll announce the next show. Good night, Danvers. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here.